Hi, today we are in a beautiful San Jose in the Aquancia office. Hi Raman, who are you and what do you do? I'm Ramin Farjad, I'm a VP of Technology at the Aquancia Corporation and uh, I, together with the team, are in charge of uh, developing interesting technologies that uh, applies to the uh, latest networking solution that big customers, you know, such as Cisco and so forth, uh, are used to differentiate themselves uh, in the marketplace. And what did you do before you started Aquancia? Well, starting from beginning, um, uh, I, I got interested in communication uh, transceivers. Back I was at Stanford, mm -hmm. uh, maybe part of my first uh, summer internship that I was working at Sun Labs, and I started working in a, a one gig transceiver, uh, which was the target was designing this whole thing in CMOS technology, which back then most people uh, tried to implement these transceivers, um, gigabit or multi-gigabit, in higher end processes like uh, gallium arsenide and so forth, which was like really fast processes. But at the same time, people could not really build them in high density to integrate with the you know, microprocessors, big logics, and so forth. And uh, part of that uh, work was extended, and uh, Sun was uh, interested to fund the research that I continued to actually turn it into a 10 gigabit per second. Uh, kind of transceiver all in CMOS. And uh, pretty much uh, that research was successful. I uh, managed to build that link in all in CMOS. Back then it was a quarter micron CMOS, which is more than uh, 10x larger than the feature sizes that people use today, which is 28 or even 14 nanometer. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, pretty much the technology showed that actually you can implement uh, even up to 10 gigabits in CMOS technology that back then people struggle to build even up to one gig. And uh, that was a big achievement in a sense, not just, hey, you know, I can do you know, 10 gig in CMOS, but because it uh, opened the door for integration into uh, much bigger chips that were already in CMOS technology, all the processors, all the also switches that back then, let's say in early 2000, uh, when it was the beginning of uh, internet opening up to the whole public and uh, bandwidth and data becomes like a necessity. People want it faster and faster, not just processor, but also switches, routers, and so forth. And uh, these switches needed to have like very high throughput. And uh, with the conventional IOs that was placed on CMOS together with the switch, the switch wasn't really practical. They have to use multiple switches, build like mm -hmm clone network, they would call it, a uh, network topology or like switch topology to be able to expand a uh, switch to turn it from n ports to multiple ports, uh, n times n or 10 times n or so forth. It was expensive, high power and so forth. And um, by being able to integrate this high speed link within inside the switch, inside the same chip, uh, they could manage to increase the throughput of the switch. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to increase it by order of magnitude, even orders of magnitude. And uh, that's why it played a critical role to the next step. And uh, back then in 2000, uh, in fact, 99, uh, I teamed up with uh, uh, a couple other people uh, in trying to turn it into, uh, actually turn this idea, turn the technology into uh, an actually a solution that mm -hmm. would benefit the industry mm -hmm. in terms of marketing. Uh, and um, through this whole process, of course, we've had challenges to be able to define the right product for the technology. And uh, uh, we, of course, uh, started a company called Velio Communication, whose uh, main um, solution product was, uh, you can call it like multi-gigabit or even terabit switches. Uh, uh, back then, we focused on optical market sun and switching and so forth because uh, the problem was really in those days uh, the long haul wide area networks and so forth and connecting cities at high speeds together and uh, 
that was kind of like a bottleneck that back then was ma- mostly wired up to do like phone networks and telephone, which is like low data rates and mm-hmm. planning to do actually like internet traffic, you know, even forget about videos, just uh, normal internet traffic uh, couldn't really go through these uh, low speed network and switches. So everybody was switching to optical communication, trying to build more, more and more uh, connections and networks and then there came the need to do high throughput routing and switching between uh, all these links and uh, that's why optical communication was uh, so hot back then before you know, it all collapsed like later on in 2002-2003. Yeah. Okay. So basically what Aquantia is selling is uh, some kind of devices with, with some switches. Uh, no, this was uh, Velia Communication was my first mm-hmm. com- company mm-hmm. that uh, I started uh, back in 99, yeah, okay. uh, 1999, and that was the focus of Velia Communication, mm-hmm. uh, building terabit switches for optical market. Okay. And then uh, after Velio, and uh, because of the you know crash of the optical market. Yeah. Uh, and all of our customers, which our big customers were uh, Lucent and Nortel. I mean, at some point we have a combined, uh, you can say purchase order little intense, uh, close to uh, $500 million of those switches. Uh, but uh, maybe within a few months they all went away. Like wow. Nortel uh, put hold on everything, uh, Lucent uh, basically shut down its whole optical division mm-hmm. and so forth. And the whole thing went away and uh, you know expecting to be a multi-billion dollar company like yeah. it didn't turn out to be that way so we sold the company uh, and uh, a year after uh, teaming up with uh, two of my partners uh, here in Aquantia, Phil Delance and Ramin Shirani, uh, we uh, started the, the company with the vision to um, being able to power the next generation of uh, data centers and networking, uh, mainly from the connectivity perspective uh, for uh, for the upcoming explosion of the data that we could see. Uh, the data was uh, increasing, not just the uh, communication of data, but also the storage of the data and so forth, uh, to the extent that um, the existing uh, solution, the connectivity solutions uh, in the data centers, in the storage centers, in the computing centers and so forth uh, was not really enough to to answer this. And back then um, people were switching from 1 gigabit to 10 gigabit, but the solutions for 10 gigabit uh, was all pretty much an optical domain, uh, meaning that they had to use optical transceivers, lasers and so forth and it ended up to be expensive uh, solutions. And knowing that these port counts that were already about like in, in hundreds of millions, if not billions in gigabit, switching them over to uh, 10 gig, all optical at price points that were like hundreds of dollars was, was a big uh, showstopper for many companies to scale to that level. Uh, price was a big deal, especially when you're talking about like you know such high s- switch counts. And our mission was to create uh, a technology uh, to be able to implement it over the copper lines and uh, away from using any optical mm-hmm. uh, components, which was pretty much also the start of the 10 G base T, which is uh, 10 gigabit over copper, over basically twisted pair copper, even not not shielded coppers uh, that just to make them even cheaper, just to make the cake all cheaper. And of course added uh, significant complexity on the chip side to make the other side cheaper and easier, mm-hmm. meaning anything external, uh, even the, all the way from connectors, cables and so forth, uh, was made to be as simple as possible, even the connection uh, of the cable to the port using like RJ45 uh, type of connector that just clicks, you know, you can find it behind your computer or laptop and that has this network port mm-hmm. versus the optical solutions that you have to nobody can just use it like that you have to align the fiber which is like a micrometer thick mm-hmm. with with the edge of the laser and making sure that the line passes through is like it takes an expert to do that every time so it wasn't something that also could be 
basically expand it uh, to the public or general market uh, unless you know it's turned into copper and easy of use ease of use of it and uh, pretty much it puts all the burden on on the technology mm -hmm. that was required to implement it and uh, we knew that is a is a big challenge of course and uh, from day one we started building you know a team that uh, we believe was superstar uh, to be able to excel in this in this market and being able to deliver it while at the same time uh, when we started we had uh, a technology uh, that uh, we believed it will also put us ahead of everybody else in delivering this solution uh, not just all in silicon but also make it in a like, low power mm -hmm. uh, because once you assume that you know each uh, each server or each rack of servers that you know you have in data center uh, could have tens of these ports and uh, each rack will have tens of servers and uh, each row of a uh, data center you can have you know 20 30 of them and then the whole data centers there could be uh, tens of thousands of hundred thousand of these servers uh, if the power is not well controlled, uh, it would be like a big, big heating machine yeah. just for connectivity and so forth. So, power was also a significant uh, part of the equation that uh, we started to solve. And we, when we entered the market, we introduced also as the low power leaders mm -hmm. who can not only solve the cost problem but also the power problem. Uh, for the system vendors. So if you would uh, rephrase the value proposition, it would basically mean that if you're looking at a data center, you <laughs> will um, improve the connectivity within a data center, uh, meaning that we, you will lower the energy cost, thereby lowering total costs of having uh, operating the data center and thereby yes. um, um, transforming data from one point to the other. Yeah, exactly. First, lowering the cost of installation. Mm -hmm. The the price they pay to install each port mm -hmm. in there, and also lowering the maintenance cost okay. moving forward in terms of you know cost of the energy and so forth. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, about uh, how defensive uh, is this, or how easy it is to de uh, defend this kind of uh, model from other competitors? <coughs> sure. Of course, the one of the reasons we approached this market as a startup. Uh, Knowing that, especially if you are in a hardware networking hardware, especially like semiconductor uh, business, and there are a lot of big companies already in this market, so you we had to definitely find a path that you know we could differentiate ourselves. And one of our biggest differentiations was, of course, you know the technology that we could introduce into this uh, into this market, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Tenji Base T um, has been, they used to call it the toughest uh, problem uh, in the communication ICs back mm -hmm. then. And it turned out to be uh, over years. Because uh, when we started, there were uh, and three public companies that started in the same same field mm -hmm. uh, together with us, plus also uh, a number of startup, I mean, startup companies. At some point, there were like seven companies doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, uh, Aquantia was the only company whose product, uh, you know, was shipped in the Cisco boxes, and uh, only one public company managed to get it right after, you know, few years after us, uh, to be able, uh, you know, to be our only competition mm -hmm. to date, uh, so far. So, one thing is to find the technology and also have a solution, knowing that you know the technology that you that you have is differentiating enough. Mm -hmm that not anybody, not so easily, can come in and compete with you in that domain. And of course, the patents that uh, protected us in that mm -hmm. domain. Uh, on top of that, I mean, of course, I should add as an entrepreneur, um, just having a cool technology doesn't mean, or like a differentiated technology doesn't mean anything. Uh, you have to see the problems that your customers have or actually going to have. I mean, uh, the smart, the smart one or more successful ones will see the waves that are coming, mm -hmm. and uh, try to prepare for it. Try to build solutions for the waves that are coming. That once they're near, you can go to your customers and say, "Hey, don't worry, I have a solution for you." Mm -hmm. And uh, 
helping the customer to win in the market, differentiating himself and basically pass the big wave and they help you in return. So creating a win-win situation mm -hmm. in such a way that customers, especially the big one, really feel that they have to use you. Otherwise, you know, the solutions, there's not many other solutions out there uh, to do so. But basically, this means that you have some hardware solutions like switches or uh, something for solving the connectivity issues in data centers. And uh, when you look at the customers, or uh, 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 customer segments, who are they? Is it only like people who are operating the data center or are this even companies like Facebook who have their own uh, data center? Our customer customers would be the likes of Facebook and so forth, right? But uh, like one of our big customers you can uh, mention is Cisco Systems mm -hmm. that uh, they actually build their you know, network OEMs that build all the big switches. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, network equipment. And in terms of revenue model, is it that you are uh, selling them on, only like re revenue per item, or is it something like a service model or an, another? No, we build chips. Mm -hmm. We build. Uh, and then you uh, only sell them, so you don't rent them or something like this. No, we just you know, sell them the chips. Uh -huh. yeah. And and how do you acquire customers? Uh, are you using uh, only a direct sales force, or are you using uh, distributional partners? No, actually, uh, our customers. Because we are not in a consumer market, mm -hmm. so our customers are all well defined. For example, mm -hmm. there's usually in the space that we work in, there's one dominant customer that oh. you know, owns maybe half the market or more. Wow. And there's another one who owns like 20, 30 percent, and the rest, you know, combined would be another 20 something percent wow. together. So we usually try to approach the first uh, top two, three, because uh, the amount of energy and uh, you can say marketing and sales force that is required to approach everyone for a small company is not really that efficient. So this, our approach is to go and target the big ones, mm -hmm. try to understand their pain points mm -hmm. and trying to understand what are the things they're working on and what are the problems that they're going to face you know, in their next generation especially mm -hmm. and then how we can solve it. And uh, convince ourselves that you know we can we can actually solve the problem for mm -hmm. them and work together with them uh, to deliver the final solution. And we've uh, implemented this model uh, at least twice mm -hmm. in the life of the, the company, and that has been part of the uh, success of Aquantia. I would yeah. say well, a big part of the success in Aquantia uh, that uh, basically helped us maneuver all the hard times, you know, and uh, all the financial crisis yeah, yeah. and so forth by having strong partners that they actually needed to have our technology. Yeah. So they ensured that, uh, you know, we stay and uh, survive yeah. and flourish and expand and be able to help them moving forward in the future. And when you look at the potential customers that you could have, and you said that they are very concentrated, um, is it that you would like to sell your solution to any potential customer who w would like to buy this? Or is it more that you go to the top two uh, customers and say, uh, guys, if you <coughs> want to differentiate from the others, 30% or so, uh, then buy with us and we give you some kind of exclusivity? Well, depends. Of course, uh, as I mentioned, because we don't have the bandwidth, necessarily in the beginning, mm -hmm. to approach everyone. Yeah. So we usually work with uh, maybe top two, three mm -hmm. big customers in the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, and making sure that you know we pipe clean all the issues that could happen. And mm -hmm. one of the things that, for example, being in the industry, you would know is that once uh, you pass the quality quality assurance of the biggest customer or the biggest guy, or biggest yeah. company in the field, then all the other companies will just waive any qualification and so forth, and mm -hmm. uh, they just comfortably come to you and buy from you. So. Mm -hmm. Rather than having to deal with like twenty companies and try to, yeah. you know, prove to them that you know it, it's good, everything's perfect, and so forth, working with one company and getting that stamp of approval, then other guys will automatically come to you because they say if they selected you to be mm -hmm. their choice, that you know, when when their vendor of the choice, then it's already guaranteed that you know it pass our our standard level. And uh, are you currently having an international customer base, or is it mainly U.S. focused? We currently we have also international, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that there are very few customers. Um, how do you prevent um, the, the situation 
happening like from uh, your former company? Because in the former company, you had also <coughs> a very um, a clumped or um, mm -hmm. very clustered uh, customer portfolio, uh, which was risky at a specific time. How do you prevent something like this uh, in <coughs> the future? Sure. One of the things uh, that you have to also be careful is that um, markets, you know, when we approach the, the optical markets, mm -hmm. of course, that was our only meaning like that specific solution that they had, that was our only line of product mm -hmm. uh, that they, uh, the company relied on. And uh, when that specific solution with a certain you know, optical market going down, uh, it was, uh, we didn't have any other product to be able to rely on. Uh, while, you know, even after that, we tried to leverage that technology to a, a different market You know, from optical, we could we could move into like IP switching, mm -hmm. for example, and the company back then tried to do that, but because this whole process happened uh, so late, and by the time that we switched and tried to, you know, address mm -hmm. the same technology, which is a great technology, into a different uh, type of application, it was too late uh, for us to be able to sell the product and survive on it. So, one of the things that we have done is that only to guarantee that don't leverage the technology for one specific application. Mm. If that application goes down, then you have you know no more time to try to yeah. you know leverage it or you know maneuver towards something else. And uh, for our application also, we from the beginning we, we try to secure at least two markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's why even if we had like hiccups in one from time to time We could rely on the other and uh, making yeah. sure that you know it's just like not just one big customer. Raman, uh, walk me through the first 12 months of Aquantia. So, how really was it like if you would uh, have to explain it to somebody uh, transparently and say, okay, this is what I was doing <coughs> day by day, this is was what, what we were focusing on, just vividly? So, first 12 months, uh, I would say, depends when you start <laughs> the first 12. Yeah. But uh, when we uh, started, you know, let's say when I quit my my job at the previous company, mm -hmm. uh, we had the promise from the from our investors mm -hmm. that uh, if we can prove to them that you know the ideas we have actually is uh, you know can be manufactured mm -hmm. and uh, can in large volume and we can actually make profit out of it and so forth, uh, they would invest in us mm -hmm. and. Um, so that given us, you know, very little money mm -hmm. for the period of whenever uh, till they prove this. Yeah. And uh, so th those were kind of challenging times uh, because, hey, we have to cut back and, you know, uh, and just work maybe 70, 80 hours uh, a week, uh, trying to make sure that, you know, we reach that milestone as, yeah. as soon as possible. At the same time, uh, the, it was a fairly big task. So we had to... Uh, get other people, other people that we respected them both technically mm -hmm. and also have worked with uh, before and you know, you know the synergy was, uh, was right uh, to get involved but uh, we couldn't expect anybody to quit his job or anything yeah. so we had to work with them uh, first excite them mm -hmm. about the potential of the technology and the potential of the market that this technology can uh, address And uh, at the same time, uh, encourage them to work almost as hard as you know we did in, in the after work, mm -hmm. maybe not the whole time. And uh, pulling everything together and be able to present it at the end that this is uh, that we can we can actually deliver this. So, what was the task? Was the task only to develop a prototype uh, of the hardware switch, or was it really to have the prototype and convince a customer, and only then the investor would? It was more of a proof of concept mm -hmm. that uh, it was not necessarily any customers involved. So, uh, usually VCs they have their own uh, technical team, which is not mm -hmm. necessarily people who work at the VCs, yeah. but uh, the other highly technical entrepreneurs in that specific mm -hmm. field that they highly respect mm -hmm. and they ask them to come and uh, you know do, do the due diligence yeah. on us right so we went through uh, maybe three different you know day-long due diligence wow. uh, uh, by three different groups and 
finally we got the check mark and we got the money and the, that was a good sign but you know a lot of work more work started afterwards because building the team mm-hmm. uh, building the whole infrastructure for the company that you know we can expand make it scalable enough and so forth it turned from uh, doing technical work into uh, building the actual company for us and one of the big lessons uh, I learned from my previous company that yes of course technology is very important uh, you need to know you have something great, but first you have to know what is the right application for it, which in this case uh, we found what would be the right application. Then the second, of course, is, is the team, building mm-hmm. the team. And uh, that becomes, I would say, one of the most important, if not the most important factor that is in like, in an entrepreneur's control. Because mm-hmm. the other one is the market. Of course, that's a very good market, but there's so much control that you can have in the market. Uh, you know, markets can go up and down and so mm-hmm. forth. You just have to be smart about it, that how you strategize uh, your path and making sure mm-hmm. that, you know, you would be safe in, in, in at times and storms and so forth. But building the thing is one of the most important things that uh, as a junior entrepreneur in my first company, uh, we didn't have much experience. Mm-hmm. We thought as long as somebody is smart enough and can answer our questions, just hire them. Yeah. And later on, we ran into a lot of uh, issues, uh, efficiency issues between mm-hmm. people. Uh, a lot of these people that we hired were really smart, but at the same time, it's my way or the highway. They didn't didn't want to work with each other. Well, okay, so they did not well cooperate. Or? Then, yeah, the cooperation was not really great. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that inefficiency added, mm-hmm. basically, it took a big toll on us uh, in the first company. That second time... Uh, being through that, we ensure that it's not just being good technically, we yeah. sometimes even uh, rejected uh, some people who were really smart, really sharp, yeah. intelligent people, genius people, just because we, we felt that the attitude doesn't mm-hmm. really match with, with the rest of the team that we had. And uh, to be honest, maybe the first 50 people that we hired uh, were the people that we either had worked before, mm-hmm. you know, or one of the people that we had hired or really worked with or knew before well enough yeah. to know is not just great from uh, you know technology expertise, but also great from personality to ensure yeah. that the synergy is perfect. And you minimize the risk because at least either you or your friend, which you knew, yes. knows how <coughs> this guy is working. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. So that was very important. It, this goes by far more than just getting reference checks yeah. from people that. Again, that's very limited to a certain extent that you can work. But working with somebody is like, you know, going on a trip with somebody, you know, a friend much better than just you know, seeing it on and off or yeah. being a roommate with someone. You even know that person much better. So working with somebody is like being a roommate for years. And usually in companies, you spend uh, maybe more time than you spend at home. And uh, the level of interaction right. is significant. So that's that was also... Uh, key part of our uh, selection for the team and some of the people that we heard honestly are key members uh, technical members that have been with us for the past 10 years mm-hmm. oh. ever since we hired them and uh, they've been with the company ever since cool. uh, Raman, um let's go back like 10-15 years or so of your time you really imagine that what would uh, be great if you would have known this before you started uh, any company so if you just go back and say, oh, if somebody would have told me this, uh, this kind of lesson, this would have helped me a lot. My, my first company, Velio, mm-hmm. uh, uh, taught me many, many lessons that we tried to kind of implement it as much as possible yeah. in, this, uh, in this company. And uh, at the same time, one of the things, uh, you know, in addition to the fact that you have to be extra careful once you get the mm-hmm. money, to build the right team because the team is the most important asset that is in your control mm-hmm. and the most important factor for your success that is in your control and the technology can actually <coughs> change even the applications that you use for the mm-hmm. technology can change as you move forward uh, believe it or not uh, as I mentioned in the first six seven months of the company before our funding we're, uh, supposed to prove that the technology that we are so excited about is the best thing since you know yeah. sliced bread <laughs> a year after we dumped the whole thing yeah 
because we found something better. Yeah. And uh, we didn't stay as, hey, this is our technology, we're going to push for it to you know, make it happen. Uh, entrepreneurs really have to be flexible. They shouldn't be attached to their original ideas uh, if they feel there are other alternatives. They yeah. have to be open-minded and open to any ideas. And you should question everything, even if it's your, you know, your baby technology. Yeah. You always have to question it. Can it be better? Can I do anything better? What is out there that can beat this? And so forth. And that is, uh, I would say, very important not to get lost or drinking your own Kool-Aid, thinking mm -hmm. that you know, you're the best. And uh, that was, I would say, um, one of the most important things. And uh, the other thing I should mention is uh, the product and the application that you use your technology. Uh, you have to make sure it is differentiating enough that people all the big companies because they would be very reluctant mm. to pick somebody with a small company with like a 50-man team to deliver a critical technology to them it becomes mm. so risky I mean mm. if you put yourself in the shoes of some executive VP making a yeah. decision at let's say Cisco that we want to go use their technology if a quantia fails the executive VP would be in serious trouble yeah. right but if give it to like some giant company with uh, you know multi-billion dollar public company with God knows like 100,000 people working for it mm -hmm. and it's been around for like 30 years. If they failed, that company failed. The, yeah. the executive VP didn't fail. So there is a lot of pressure on the decision maker in the big company to mm -hmm. go with you, right? So they have to have the very convincing reason in a way that uh, you have to create great enough differentiation for them. Mm -hmm. that they say, okay, if I don't go with them, yeah. there's nothing out there, and then my competition, my competition may pick them, and yeah. then they may get ahead. So they take the risk for the right reward. And you have to continue making that differentiation to sustain, because you start going up on a path to say, I'm different from everyone, and then as soon as the big guys notice that, hey, mm -hmm. you're up there, they start the development right away, because they don't want to yeah. fall behind. And you have to continue that and continuously offer the differentiations mm -hmm. uh, that this big customers uh, they feel that they have to stick with you and uh, never go back and try yeah. to consider the, the alternative. One of the things that uh, a lot of uh, companies fall into uh, is the fact that after some point and after they feel you know they have a you know a solution or a technology when the other guys catch up they try to add uh, I would say maybe change the prices to say hey, we offer you like lower prices or add a uh, little bit features here and there to make it attractive uh, and if you go on and see if that the features mm -hmm. that that is added is not something significant uh, the other guys can also add it right so this competition, rather than competition on the small steps, rather than differentiating people, mm -hmm. actually causes everybody to to be the same. Because as soon as I say, I add this feature that you know does this extra thing, yeah. if it's like easy, the, all the other guys will add it. It becomes more and more complex product mm -hmm. uh, that everybody has. So the differentiation actually becomes nothing. But the differentiation has to be in such a way that is like great uh, leaps that. Uh, gets others by surprise mm -hmm. and before they can catch up to it you already got the next market or you mm -hmm. got the next wins and so forth and this is uh, what you know an agile and uh, I would say knowledgeable team with uh, enough experience both on the technology and the business to know what is the next great technology and what are the you know problems that are coming towards my big customers? Even you have to, you have to know better than them what their problems is and try to solve them for the next wave. Uh, and that way, uh, that's how we survive. Great and grow. Brahman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. And next time you're thinking about starting a company, you need to be very crystal clear about your value proposition so that you make sure that you're differentiated from all the other people. And don't be only better like 10%, but maybe 10x. Thank you so much. Great.